Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Speak Easy. My name is Glenn Scrivener, and going around in counterclockwise direction is Paul Feasy, Nate Morgan Lock. I sort of forgot. Uh, but was. also in the room, uh, <laughs> we've got uh, a, a couple of uh, guests at our intensive down here in Eastbourne. We uh, have a, a week long of activities for creative Christians. So, do you want to say hello to the people? There we go. Who, who do we have with us? Hello, I'm Joy. And I'm Fraser. Excellent. And uh, we'll, we'll be coming to join Fraser uh, throughout this evening uh, to discover wisdom, tidbits, um, just some of your private fantasies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Generally. Um, yeah. Um, what, what issue can we help you with this <laughs> evening, Fraser? <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us for a start. So... Uh, so the intensive is uh, so we put on we put on four of these during uh, the year. We've had a September one. This is December. We're going to have March and May, and people come down and we get together to talk about the sort of the intersection between creativity and theology and making some noise for Jesus as creative people. Um, Fraser, why have you wanted to come down to the intensive? Uh, yeah, so I thought it would be helpful to to kind of gain some skills. Um, to help me in my my work for um, church and work for a church in Glasgow, um, the Tron Church in Glasgow, and I think the stuff we're talking about here is just really relevant to a lot of the work that I'm doing there. Fantastic! So coming down from Glasgow, and Joy, you've come down from Sheffield, is that right? Yes, that's right. Um, so yeah, I like making things and telling stories, and I wanted to meet other Christians who do the same sort of thing and just learn from everybody else. Excellent. Making things and telling stories. That's what we're all about here at Speak Life. And uh, what we want to do over the course of this Speak Easy is ask some questions about mm. Christianity and creativity. Surely, as Christians, we don't want to get creative with the gospel. The gospel has been delivered once for all. We dare not alter a syllable of it, right? So what is it yeah. about being creative and being a Christian? Is there a tension? Is there a synthesis? Mm, is there mm. synergy? Is the the dove floating off? There yeah. might be. There might be. Um, to kick us off, um, let me ask the question. Okay, art. When you think about creativity, you think of art. Okay, mm. what is what is art? Well, you've been in Rome, so uh. you tell me. <laughs> I ask the question. <laughs> Don't uh, what is art? Um, well, you go around the 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 Tate Modern. And anything's art, isn't it? <laughs> That's right. Oh, look, there's a fire extinguisher. That's art. Yes. Unmade bed. Oh, it's all Unmade art. Dodd. Yeah. Um, it's quite hard to come up with a succinct def definition, but I think it's stuff people make. Yeah. Okay. Stuff. <laughs> all right. So if you make a spreadsheet, is that... There is an art to making a spreadsheet. <laughs> and if I knew anything about <laughs> if I literally knew what Excel was, I would be able to do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So th there is a, the, a there's, it's the sense in which art is one of those big catch-all words that we use a lot, but we're probably using it in different ways when we use it. So it's a bit like love. You know, you sort of that word gets used for all sorts of things when. You only mean it in particular ways, in particular contexts. Um, but when we generally talk about art, we're thinking about the stuff, the stuff people make, which is especially creative or beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's probably the yeah. way most people would th be thinking about using it when they say, "Oh, I, w I like art." Yeah. Whereas yes. the art of doing things, art is closely connected to craft yes. and the, literally the technical prowess of making a thing or performing a task is is an art yes yeah. so beauty has got to have a lot to do with it i i um interviewed andrew peterson early in the in the year and he said in answer to the question what is art it's it is making um more specifically than stuff making worlds it's world building right so he he kind of pointed to all right obviously god is the first world builder and then we're made in his image and then what Adam is able to do is not the same as what God does, because God makes the world out of nothing. But what Adam is able to do is to name the world mm. and to put a layer of culture on top of the world and to sort of to offer a pair of spectacles through which you can view. Ah, it's a badger. Ah, it's yeah. a llama. Ah, it's a flamingo. Yeah. You know, um, but suddenly in in naming the world, he has added an extra layer to the world and sort yeah. of built built on the world and built the world. And maybe what we're doing 
as sub creators in God's creation yeah. is building well, because the world. that 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 part of of Genesis two when Adam's naming the animals mm. is often used with regard to the scientific work that man does. Yes. So man is looking to, in a sense, tame the world by naming the world and saying what a thing is and what a thing isn't, which feels like a much more scientific exercise. Whereas I suppose when people think of art, they probably think more in terms of creativity, more in terms of the imagination. And yeah. so we yeah. might have more of a challenge to see those verses in Genesis 2 from a Western perspective as a more artistic enterprise. So maybe from, maybe the end of Genesis 2 when he sings, you know, this is bone of my bones and flesh <laughs> yeah. of my flesh, yeah. which is using words not just in a kind of a utilitarian sense, but yeah. to use artistry to... Yeah, to make to make the words yeah. beautiful and not just functional. Yes, and and there's another thing there, which is, in one sense, he's reacting to what is out there in the world that God's already made, but there's a sense in which, particularly in that song, there's something he's expressing out from himself, which is an art takes an artistic form. Yes, and and I think a lot of the time when there is a fear around art, or creativity or the imagination is the idea that oh that's just about self-expression mm. mm. which isn't really a good definition of art throughout the human history but certainly at the moment we think of it oh well art when the kids do art what shall they do they just paint what you like how do you feel you show us how you feel yep. through the there's art there's no right or wrong yeah there's no beautiful and ugly then at that stage and then it's also completely um uh, juxtaposed with scientific approaches which is nothing to do with self expression of course no right. there's no self expression in in science that's yeah. about what's real and measurable and and testable Except that maybe the yeah. postmodern rot is even sort of intruding on the realm of truth, you know, such that, well, you know, the, like the ancient triad of beauty, goodness, and truth. Yeah. I think probably from the 1960s onwards, there was very much the sense of, well, goodness, who's to say, you know, your morality might not be yeah. my morality. Um, and then so you, you sort of erode the sense of an objective goodness. And you sort of erode the sense of an objective beauty. Because you know you can't you can't tell me that there's an objective standard by which you can judge a poem or judge a symphony. Yeah. But now you know even things like two plus two equals four is, is the sort of truth that's now. How dare you? It's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wonder whether um, yeah even even truth is getting eroded yeah. by that sense. But cer but certainly beauty, beauty is. The it's almost the first thing that you trade away to a sense of subjectivity. You're like, well, there's, there's no right or wrong answer. Mm. A poem is just a poem. There's not bad poetry or good poetry, yeah. is there? I think we kind of want to say there is bad poetry. Like, I've written plenty of it. So, you know, I should, <laughs> yeah, I should yeah. know. I've, yeah. I've had first-hand experience. Of, but we, we, feel really, we feel really bad about saying that there's an objective standard of beauty, I think. We, we feel as though it's just taste. Some people like jazz music. Yeah. Some people like trip hop music. I don't know. Trip hop. Great. I was caught between hip hop and trap, but you know, never mind. Trip hop. <laughs> Funky house music. That they're the hippity to. hop. Aren't they into the hippity hop? These kids these days. Um, Christoph Keating uh, said, art is seeking to represent the beautiful for its own sake rather than for some utilitarian purpose. Which again, art for its own sake, is yeah. something that Martin Bailey on the top chat is also in agreement with. Is it something that's purpose is in itself, not in what it does? So it's not it's not functional. It's just cause, you know. Which is kind of nice about like when God made yeah. the world. Yeah. Why did God make the world? I think lots of other worldviews out there say, well, God made the world so that we would serve the gods. Whereas in the Bible, yes. it's like God made it just cause, because because mm. He wanted to. Cause, and that was self-expression. Yes. You know? And therefore, he doesn't use his art for the sake of something else. It's like a... Yes, the, the use... But I don't think we want to say art is defined by its uselessness in, in, in that sense. It's just for its own sake. Mm -hmm. I think you'd want to protect that definition and say it doesn't, as so many of our conversations around, around art within the evangelical world... It feels as though it's a waste of time unless it has some other purpose. Mm. 
and I, I think we want to protect the arts and creative work from this need to, you know, basically just be a, 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 a badly wrapped sermon. Yes. Um, yes. I'm not having a go at spoken word there. <laughs> yeah, no, sorry. <laughs> I mean, spoken wrapped word with is a, basically like, a like bad this, sermon, like but you karate wrapped, chop yeah, the yeah. air while you <laughs> do a bad sermon. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> to say <laughs> that's another conversation to have. <laughs> But to say we do want to say that art needs no justification, yeah, in that sense, yeah, yeah, which I think. Is um, but but I suppose you know it's tr tricky when you if you use the word in the definition of itself, it can be a bit tricky. But we're gonna we're gonna get on to the ways in which Christians can use art for other purposes, and yeah. I and I think it's very possible that Christians can use art as more like propaganda. Have you, have you seen examples of this, Paul, that yeah. we can rail against? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I won't name any names. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a lot of kind of, um, Christi kind of Christian movie type things, particularly which very much have in mind they, they've got an agenda and they want to get across a particular message. Mm. Um, and generally what then happens is you end up with this kind of piece of, I mean, you can call it art, I suppose. Um, but this kind of piece of media that um, doesn't really, I don't know, it doesn't seem to be uh, a kind of a good expression of anything. It's just trying to get people to land on a certain theological mm. point. Yeah. Um, and you come away from it not feeling like you've seen a, a, listened to a good song or watched a good movie or anything like that, but like you've just been bludgeoned around the head with a kind of very poor sermon. <laughs> yes. <And> I, mm. <laughs> yes. And whatever artistry might be used, you kind of feel a bit icky about it because you, you then think, oh, that's just bait. Mm. And what yeah. they really wanted to do is get me with the hook of their propaganda, their message. Yeah. And it's it, so the, I always think about this in terms of, you know, during an international football tournament, you'll have all the England flags will be out mm. around and people have them on the cars outside the houses and things. And the, the ones that always make me slightly shudder, <laughs> I'm like, you just physically oh, different right then, yeah, is when it's an England flag, so it's the white cross of St George, yeah, right, with the word England written on it. Oh, okay, because that that sort of defeats the purpose of a flag. <laughs> <laughs> if you're just going to write the name of the country. We don't need flags anymore, do we? <laughs> Just have pieces of A4 paper with countries' names written on them. It's just exposition. It's too much exposition. Exactly. It's yeah. like so subtitles people. for people who can't understand how flags work, <laughs> which is usually through color and shape. So it's that's where you just go, I think you've missed the the point <laughs> of a flag. So yeah. You don't need to write the country's yes. name on it. Because the person's good. probably sh yelling the word as well. Yes. England! Yeah. And yeah. Adding all, syllables. Yeah. Yeah. All three syllables. <laughs> but yes, that's that's one of those things where I just think, what's the point? What's the point? And that's that, that's how it goes for a lot of a lot of what we would call evangelical art, in which it hasn't been made respecting the particular constraints and and beauty of the art form. Right. It's sort of been bludgeoned and mm. right you know right it's been ruined yes and and again it's it's part ruined. of that it's it's part of yeah. that like using something for a different purpose you know yeah. so i mean andrew peterson again like i highly recommend people checking out the um the interview that he gave back in the summer um because he he narrates this hilarious but also just tragic example of him doing his behold the lamb concerts mm. um in a church and a church got them in and like terrific Nashville kind of musicians, which are, you know, top level. And they're, and they're kind of worshiping Jesus with every song mm. and they finish the concert by um, singing Psalm 100 like together. Yeah. And then the musicians all kind of exit the stage while the audience are all singing praises to God. Mm. But they did this in a church and like the, the pastor of the church, like insisted on then coming out afterwards and doing like a 15 minute evangelistic presentation. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it's like, what made you think but that, no, that but could it was, possibly but be it, a better ending? But it was the pit, it wasn't it? He, it was about an, a, a man trying to communicate with ants. Yes. And so it was, it was this slightly awkward. He then used an illustration, blunt which is interesting. illustration yeah. of how would you, a man communicate with ants? He could become an ant. 
You're like, <laughs> he could wow. be Ant Man. Is that what you're saying? Because that is a thing <laughs> that we already have. And it's... where's some water? I just got to get baptized. I just... <laughs> so, but that, and, and in that sense, you want to say, yeah, absolutely. You've you've sort of missed the the value and weight and beauty of the ending, and decided to actually make it slightly awkward by coming out with something else i suppose my the the challenge with that is and we think about this earlier on today but how do you appreciate the depth and beauty of particular art forms right of great music great film great poetry whatever it might be and not basically become a snob who can't see the value in a guy does a talk about a man becoming an ant in order to die for the ants could be used mm. by God in all its foolishness yep. in a context in which people aren't too bothered about. Yeah, singing doxology. Yeah, and, so yeah. so it's it's that really hard thing. Where a love for the arts, mm. which we're you know, it's frustrating when people don't appreciate them, and it's frustrating when people think creativity is just a waste of time, but at the same time. The fear is that we get so kind of locked into a real sophisticated palette for right. artistic expression that then we're sort of slightly ruined for anything that isn't, yeah. which you know, is just snobbery, basically. Yeah, and yeah. and it, yeah, so it, it's and it's hard because it happens every it happens with coffee. Like if people <laughs> like drinking good coffee, after a while, someone will offer them a like you know, was it a what was it? Cafe Hog. Do you remember Cafe Hog? No. They probably don't have it anymore. But it was basically the granulate granules of coffee, freeze dried coffee. Okay, like and international roast sort of thing. Like yeah, like that, it's that all like a really of, like yeah. cheap, right? Like simple instant coffee. Yes. And they would they would probably just throw it back in your face. Yeah. They would probably well they probably spit it into your face because <laughs> they can't stand it and they probably hate you because yeah. you like it. Yeah. So how do you how do we do that? How do we appreciate the value of art without becoming snobs who, as you don't value people, who aren't as sophisticated as we are when we're watching, you know, yes. Terence Malick movies, <laughs> and, you know, for example. Yes, yes. So we're not we're not saying we need to become Charlie Kaufman or Terence Malick yeah. and be incredibly highfalutin and and yeah. use high art. But we are we are saying God has made us creative, and mm. this uh, and and there's a way of communicating um, that we are we are missing out massive chunks of a human being if all we're doing is downloading information yeah. on them. Yeah, and to to honor the humanity in me and the humanity in them, and and maybe it's you know Beethoven, or yeah. maybe it's Bad Out of Hell, yeah. like. But <laughs> <laughs> I know which one I prefer. <laughs> <laughs> but on on some level, can we please engage the imagination? I mean, I don't think mm. it's. I think often the, the issue for us as Christians, though, is that particularly in some of the circles we we've moved in, we don't trust. There's a lack of trust that people will pick up on anything which mm. is kind of less subtle than simply a preach. You right. know, and so particularly in our circles, the often the highest thing is the preach. That's what we often think about, isn't it? And we've talked about some of those issues in the, you know, about how that ends up distorting lots of people's gifts anyway by mm. putting the preacher at the top all the time. But because we're so preoccupied with it's the preach that's a thing, when you start to do art, art just becomes a way to do a preach, mm. um, and then it and it becomes not a very good preach as well. I think often in Christian things, it becomes the bludgeon you round the head with it. So you can still, pre- you know, there, there are a lot, everything preaches, I suppose, in some way, shape mm. or form. But, you know, if you think to some of the videos we've done over the past few years, or even this year with the uh, the Christ mouse, yeah, there is not like, you don't get to the end of that video and you go, oh, I I understand penal substitution and I, yeah, yeah. I understand I'm a sinner who needs to repent and give my life to Jesus. And I think what sometimes as Christians, some people are scared of that. They go like, well, if we haven't got that in, yeah, 
you know, surely well, this you, isn't good enough. If you, know? you had a more sophisticated palate, I think you would have picked that up. <laughs> <laughs> it was all there. It was just subtle. Right. Yeah. And, you know, really it reference some... Fellini, I believe, in the, in the second minute. <laughs> yeah. I really want some cheese. <laughs> so, no. That's Paul's level. That's yeah, it, it's quite yeah. a refined palate. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so we, we want art to, to be beautiful and not to be the bait that then hooks people in. Mm. So what, what is good art capable of, right? Because it, like, it doesn't just deliver a dopamine hit. Lots of things could deliver a dopamine hit. Yeah. What, what can art achieve? Well, I mean, I think... I think I mean good art in any form can it, it can do all kinds of things. I suppose, can't it? I mean, you can you can listen to you can come away from a film and you can be profoundly affected by by it. You know, mm. even if it's the story is removed from you, there can you you can sometimes sit there and think, mm. you know, wow, that really gets me thinking about this, that, or the other. You know, you know, it makes you think bigger things than just oh, I've finished the story now. We all go home and. Yeah. Do that, or you listen to a piece of music, and you know you can be moved to tears by right. music, and you know it has a profound effect on the emotions, doesn't it, as well? Um, and I don't think that's just kind of manipulation. Yeah, you know, but that, that's what that, we—that's the classic. Mm-hmm. That would be the mm-hmm. Christian thing. Oh, it's just manipulating mm-hmm. people, isn't it, to affected. feel certain things? And of course, yeah. you can manipulate people with yeah. with music and stuff. And you know, we've probably all seen you know clips of films or TV shows where they change the music. And you see, and it just feels like a different thing entirely. So that obviously does happen. But yet, I think, you know, these things do speak to us on a deeper level, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. What level? Like, what is, what is that? <laughs> what is it? What is when you that? Are, when you are moved by beauty, when you're, mo- when you're moved by art. Like, yeah. I think you're being, being drawn out from yourself at some level. Mm-hmm. And you're being, you are being drawn into and invited into a, a a stream of the world, which which is is put there by the divine, right? It is put there by God. It, it beauty is God's idea, mm-hmm. and so when human beings manage to create things which you know resonate at that frequency, you know, to use a slightly awkward analogy for it but when we when we are able to create things it draws people out from themselves and can give them a sense of their position in in the universe Mm -hmm. in a way it and and it doesn't always have to do that in a way that feels especially comforting or comfortable Mm. it can it can leave people feeling alienated and then the question is well is there anything in that particular work of art to suggest that that might not be the final word on reality Mm. Mm. because that's the challenge because it's there and we're all made in the image of god and so we all have this creative capacity and we can develop it and train ourselves and learn the craft and all that sort of stuff whatever our worldview is is going to uh, going to come out in what we create right and so if you have an impoverished picture of reality and and yet you're a brilliant artist you can leave people ruined because you show them you know, you you hang them over the abyss, and they have nothing to comfort themselves, mm-hmm. and they then just have to be, I don't know, distracted with a joke or something like that. Yes. But but if someone's art is is coming from a an understanding of of God's world, mm-hmm. created and governed by Father, Son, and Spirit, right? Then there is there is actually hope that art can communicate something deeper than the many the many prosaic sentences mm. you know prose can be art as well but 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 simple statements of fact could do because it moves you yeah. and it it taps you into something else so you can be a very good builder of a world but if the world that you're building is an anemic vision of reality and mm. a false vision of reality, yeah. then you're harming people, really, by bringing mm. them into that world, yeah. into a less... But sometimes people, I think, whenever you have a piece of art, like a film, sometimes you might come away from it, 
and and you you come away from some films don't you as a christian and you can look at it and you can say oh there's some christian themes in there mm. you know, i mean the classic is there's some kind of sacrifice you know the one who sacrifices themselves for the many or something you know really kind of yeah. quite an obvious kind of thing but equally there is that flip side where you can come out and feel that was quite almost anti-christian even if it's not you know it's not explicitly someone being anti-christian yeah. Yeah. but it's it's kind of it leaves you like you say hanging mm. um but it I think again, it, that's how art speaks to you know. That it can speak to you if you if you're sitting there feeling like there's something wrong here. Mm. Mm. It's pointing you to something that must be right. Yeah, you know. So there must yeah. be an objective thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know. I don't even know. It's a good example. I mean, there's there's very few films I come out of or get to the end of and think like, oh, that was awful in the sense of, I just feel like the message in here was so off. You've um, obviously not seen the Trolls Holiday Special. <laughs> I have wow. seen the My Little Pony film, though. Oh. Actually, that's, oh, man. that's actually not as bad as some people think. <laughs> but the one for, I say I remember coming out, um, uh, I think we uh, we must have watched it at home once, the film I Give It a Year. Oh, yeah. That one. Horrendous. And I got to the end yeah. of it. And so so basically you've got this married couple and then there's like another, another girl. And... Um, Basically, they end up at the end, just the married couple split so that the other guy can go off and be with the, the girlfriend, you know, the girl he loves. Um, but it just had such a low view of marriage mm. that it was just so throwaway. Yeah. And I came, it finished and I was just like, this is awful. Is that the one that ends with, I divorce you, I divorce you too? Yeah, and that yeah, was like exactly. The, like right. that was a good thing. Like yeah. two people going yeah, like, yeah, yeah. hey, if isn't it great just to just throw go, away our divorce and, you know, throw away our marriage. And Yeah. So the give it a year in the title was a reference to the marriage. Yes. Yeah. Not the relationship that was about to start. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows, though, given their approach to relationships. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I give that one six months. <laughs> and, and yeah, then, we... then after that, who knows? Yeah, yeah. So that, the, and, and using artistry that's built a world that is just icky to spend 90 minutes in. And mm. you and you come out come away feeling unclean. Or, although there'll be many people who have just thought, "Ah, oh, what a liberating message." Well, clearly, some people d- to make that film. Presumably, someone does feel that is a liberating, and empowering yeah. message to leave at the end of the day. So, yeah, yeah, that's that's quite tricky. It's a powerful thing. It's mm. a very powerful thing, and, and 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 perhaps cinema is the most powerful of you know the the art forms in terms of its this sort of synthesis of visual and sound, and yep. it's so immersive. It's so central to our culture, and and. And so, therefore, therefore, should Christians be making films? And if so, what kind of films should we be making? Mm, that's a very good question. But fortunately, we've got two <laughs> people here who uh, know all about this. Um, Joy, <laughs> <laughs> come on, tell us, give us, uh, give us an answer. What do you think, should Christians? Christians should films? Christians be making films? Christians should be making good films. Christian. Ah, I like that. Good I films. like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fraser, what do you think? Um, as I was thinking, <laughs> taking it back to the question of the function of art yeah. and whether it ought to have a function or not. And often art has been countercultural and thus shaped culture towards the, the direction in which it's countercultural. So how then could Christian art in being countercultural potentially shape culture through that art is that a function that could, they could have mm. how can we ask a question and we've just got a question <laughs> <by> <laughs> so yeah. he's, he's done this before he's, hasn't he yeah, <laughs> very good uh, very so, Jesus so just let me check so so we're saying art is cult is is culture making in a way that it it isn't just an expression of culture but it can shift culture and you, are you asking what is it that we can do as Christians living in a culture which feels post-Christian to sort of redress, you know, thing, point things in our direction again? Is that is that the sort of thing? So how do we make counter-cultural good films? They've got to be good. Yes. I agree. Yes. Yeah. Like it's the the tweet I always reference from back from 2017. Someone came out of the um, National Gallery and they said, "I've just been through the Western art." Um, wing of the National Gallery and I can summarize it in seven words a thousand years of crucifixions then stripes mm. and and what's interesting to me about that is is for a millennium plus the Christian church was very comfortable telling its really weird story 
Like, mm. like here is a symbol of execution. Here's, here's a method of execution, and we're going to call it sacred art. It's the most subversive countercultural. You know, like to 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 depict a crucifixion at all mm. is like a ridiculous thing. But to say that your God shows up on that on, on that cross is very really, and and yet Christians with confidence in their story kept mm. on telling their countercultural story, and guess what? It became the culture. You know, so are, are there ways that we need to just regain confidence that the preaching of the cross, no matter how countercultural, is what we'll build? And the preaching of the cross, as preaching or as culture making, as film, like it, so, is there a way in in to if you make a Jesus film? Right, because you know clearly the crucifixions are paintings of Jesus, right? So I, obviously there's wings of the church who are going to have issues with depicting Jesus at all. But to make a Jesus movie feels like, oh, how do you now do that without it fe- already feeling like, right. right? Oh, and and the chosen would be an example of of something that's happening at the moment, yeah. which which has a lot of support. Um, I haven't seen it, but. It it seems as though that is doing a good job at making a good film and and doing a good representation of this, mm-hmm. but then the other Jesus films, whether it's uh, Passion of the Christ or what was the one that had um, oh just Greatest the TV story ever told or yeah yeah so so those ones are we are we limited to just doing a sandals and, and swords, swords Jesus yeah. film yeah. No, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, so alongside all those crucifixes, you've you've also got the life of the saints, and you've got the martyrs, and you've got all sorts of stories that the church was constantly telling themselves about what was heroic behavior, yeah, and what was heroic behavior might might look like a monk who is stopping the gladiatorial games and getting stoned for his for his efforts, or a nun picking up the exposed babies and adopting them into the nunnery and raising them and or, yeah. or doing any number of very countercultural things. Yeah. Um but it was all it was always it was always strange things and countercultural mm. things and not yeah. and not I give it a year, you know. Yeah. Well no, I think and I think that's that's the kind of thing which is I think people would as Christians today sometimes we struggle with that kind of thing. Mm. Because we say, well, we might get to the end of that, and people will go, well, that nun was nice, wasn't she? <laughs> you go, but they won't have heard about Jesus. <laughs> and you go, is that all it has to be, though? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I mean, what would be a Christ- I mean, how would you do a countercultural version of "I Give It a Year"? What would be your? What would be the Christian? Could you? Could yeah. you do it? Well, if you, the, the th- here's the question: Is the plot of I Give It a Year, which I can't believe we're talking <laughs> mainly about uh, this film that no one liked. But if if there is a Christian version of that film, is is the way to tell the same story that you you show the darkness and ugliness of it, and yeah. so it's not mm. a romantic comedy, it's a tragedy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And is it simply that sin has been painted in virtue's colors and that's what we've been we've been shown. Whereas a Christian doesn't need to change the ending, hmm. but can tell the same story yeah, and just, say, just "Oh my goodness, music. that was so bleak." <laughs> yeah, yeah, just change the soundtrack, right? Yeah, yeah. and you know, desaturate the colors. And, yeah, yeah. You know, and these guys are made for each other. Yeah. in in the very negative sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're made yeah. for each other. Like they're welcome yeah. to each other. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah, no, totally. Or just depicting. I mean. What's interesting is you could you could poo poo the depiction of happy family life because that's that sounds so saccharine, you know, a father <sighs> tucking in his six year old daughter to bed yeah. and saying, "I love you, honey. I love you too." Night night, and you think, "Oh, that's just hackneyed. That's mm. just schmaltzy, right? We don't want any of that." And yet, that that is the vast majority of what it's like to tuck in a six year old girl, yeah, and yeah. And, yeah. and it's a beautiful thing. How do you how do you do that well? I don't know, but it's it's worth depicting the positives when you when you see people yeah. building those kinds of worlds of negatives. It's it's worth. But and I think that's part of the issue with you know the the great evangelical filmmaking scene, which is overwhelmingly in the states, but that has those kind of Christian movies, you know, Prayer Room or or God's Not Dead or whatever it is. The issue is not that they they just. Um, that they won't show any any bad 
endings or everyone's got to come to Christ at the end or, or whatever it might be. It's that the good guys are far too good. Yeah. And the bad guys are far too bad. Yeah. So that it doesn't paint a, an accurate representation of the world as we know it to be. And so it's just like, well, that that's obviously propaganda because yeah. we know that that's not what people are like. Yeah. Now, now the challenge I think we face in terms of being countercultural, to come back to Fraser's question, is that we don't have, we haven't had for a while, I think, a clergy hero story. So, so if there's a clergyman, if there is a full-time Christian who is identified within the film as being a Christian, they can't be the hero because... That's, you know, part of this terrible, oppressive, mean, you know, Western patriarchal system, right? So Christians are obviously bigoted because, and that's the shorthand. So that's what's out in the culture. So to to write stories which had heroic vicars or priests or minor canons, if you were to read the Griffin and Minor Canon, you can have something which might make people think, oh, what if there was a possibility for a virtuous man of God? Huh, mm -hmm. that would be an interesting thing. And in a way, though you're writing at large with the, the book you've got coming out next year, we're talking about the, the power of the church in giving us all these things we now take for granted in the 21st century. And we're diminishing the impact of the Jesus revolution is there a way to do that with individual stories mm -hmm. to say let's let's re-elevate or re-up the, the 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 christian character mm -hmm. but paint it in in an accurate way which which respects the art form and doesn't you know just clobber people over the head with yeah. and now you too should get on your knees and, and accept jesus and your heart I think like Mayor of Easttown, uh, with Kate Winslet in it. Yeah, it's a superb series was on HBO, I think, and yeah, it's on Sky One, I think. Um, so I, I think I think it navigates that well. I think I think the writer was Catholic, and it's sort of depicted in where you kind of live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. Um, Easttown. It's Del Delco, Delaware County, Pennsylvania. Okay. Yeah. And I think they I think they do a very good job of showing the ambiguity of humans because as you said with God's not dead the goodies are too good and the baddies are too bad yeah. but they've got two clergymen and and one is very compromised and mm. one is kind of a good guy mm. and uh, when he speaks with integrity that the whole town listens yeah. Um, I mean, the, I mean, Mayor of Easttown is so Catholic. It, it ends up literally with the bodily, bodily assumption of Mary. <laughs> she, yeah. she goes up into the attic, but uh, that's, but I think there are there are rare examples yeah. of uh, of Christians who are kind of kind of heroes. Christoph says, uh, "All Saints" in 2017 is a clergy hero story made in okay. mainstream Hollywood. Huh. Um, and and the one I thought of as well, Silence. Uh, Christoph says yes. would be a clergy hero story yeah, of yeah. sorts. Definitely not black and white. Yeah. Um, well, Silence is a very difficult film to watch. Yeah. 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 Um, mm. Should we have a look? Um, we're we're going to have a look at um, a very funny uh, part from Community. <laughs> can you set, can you set up the clip for us, uh, Nate? Why why are we watching this clip from Community? Okay. So uh, Community is written by Dan Harmon, who uh, I usually reference because he has probably done more than anyone else to uh, promote um, Joseph Campbell's hero's journey as a tool for writing uh, stories. And Dan Harmon, uh, writer of Community, and Rick and Morty and, and other things that we probably shouldn't recommend. <laughs> <laughs> but um, he has an episode called Messianic Myths and I've forgotten the other part of the... Of the Postmodern of the, Jesus. Postmodern no? Jesus. Mm -hmm. And uh, in this uh, episode, Shirley, who is the the, the Christian um, African American lady, uh, has become aware of the YouTube <laughs> and its ability to provide um, viral uh, messages, and the fact that millions of people can watch it. So she approaches the uh, socially awkward and television and and movie informed Abed. 
and asks him if he would help her to make a video for her church mm. so more people would know about Jesus. Excellent. His name is Abed, which is yes. important. Let's have a look. Shirley, I read the New Testament. The whole thing? You know, being raised by TV and movies, I always thought that Jesus just walked on water and told people not to have abortions, but it's so much cooler than that. He was like E.T., Edward Scissorhands, and Marty McFly combined. Mm-hmm. I would love to make a Jesus movie. Oh, Abed, that's wonderful. What do you think we should do? It needs to be cool and addictive, like that video of the kitten falling asleep. Absolutely. But the story's been told to death, so I want to approach it in a new way. We need a Jesus movie for the post-postmodern world. Like Jesus as a rapper? No. I want to tell the story of Jesus from the perspective of a filmmaker exploring the life of Jesus. That sounds very appealing to filmmakers. See, in the filmmaker's film, Jesus is a filmmaker trying to find God with his camera. But then the filmmaker realizes that he's actually Jesus and he's being filmed by God's camera. And it goes like that forever in both directions, like a mirror in a mirror, because all of the filmmakers are Jesus and all of their cameras are God. And the movie's called Abed. All caps. Filmmaking beyond film. A meta film. My masterpiece. I I don't like it. Well, that's okay. You know, you're reacting the way the world did to Jesus. I'm reacting the way the world does to movies about making movies about making movies. I mean, come on, Charlie Kaufman. Some of us have work in the morning. Damn. Does this mean you don't want to work on the movie? This means there is no movie. This is the movie. The game is Jackson. <laughs> So there we are. What, so what does she want to get out of this film? So, well, she just basically realizes that her church has got like eight people in it. Mm. And yet 14 million people have just watched a video of a guy, you know, skiing with his cat or something like that. And so she thinks, well, here's an opportunity. Here's the technology. If the church got behind this, we could make a little message. And, of course, our bed reads the whole new testament overnight (laughs) and well funnily enough he goes deep and says hold on i i thought jesus was just a guy who walked on water and told people not to have abortions right so he's taking this cultural view which is Mm. jesus as random miracle guy and don't do this and then he's saying whoa no he's like et Edward Scissorhands and Marty McFly combined. <laughs> He's the most interesting character. So you think, right. wow, Dan Harmon, you've got it. You've realized that there's so much more to Jesus, so much more to the Messiah than, you know, the classic cultural uh, depictions of him. And then in a way, he manages to both mock Abed's kind of meta film about making a film about making a film about making a film about Jesus and also slightly mock uh, Shirley because she's saying maybe just Jesus is a rapper, <laughs> which also feels too lightweight. So so I think it's a brilliant way because as the audience, we're being shown the kind of stupidity of both of these extremes. One, which is so self-indulgent, wrapped up in its own aesthetic sensitivity. And the other, which is just <laughs> blunt crass mm-hmm. pathetic now it's really interesting to see what happens over the rest of the episode and uh, people can find that where they find community but um yeah i just think it's a really interesting way to address how do we tell the story of jesus in the internet age mm. with 2000 years of, of christian art mm-hmm. history behind us yeah yeah and when you look back at that art history, I, I was just in Rome last week for um, the filming of a poem and a, and a promo video that we're going to release soon. Um, and it's it's very interesting that, you know, those Jesuses were white Italian actors or, mm. what it, you know, like models yeah. who were brought in. And, and very often Jesus was dying on an Italian, like, hillside. And okay. behind there was all sorts of kind of, like, uh, it was modern for the renaissance yeah and and so there has always been an updating you know and and there always kind of has to be because you you've always got to ride that that sort of dual um impetus of of either being on the cutting edge or being totally derivative you know like like just repetition or total representation like 
you've always got to do those both of those things so in a sense it's not a new question like to, to have to represent jesus in yeah. a modern internet age yeah, yeah. in the age of the youtube yeah but um but i but i think i it, it made me think when i was going through the vatican museum and, and seeing it at times you know here's a very italian jesus dying in a very italian town how how could you tell he was an italian jesus i just Actually, yeah, he looked like a cricket umpire a lot. So he was he was always doing this. Okay. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but, it, but he certainly did not look like a brown man in the Middle East. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, he looked like a, a white guy in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Um, which, mm. so bring that into, and maybe bring that into community and maybe Jesus the Rapper yeah. is not the stupidest, you know, like, I haven't seen Jesus of Montreal. Have you seen Jesus of Montreal? I haven't, no, but I w- it was on my watch list and very close to the top of that watch list for a while and then I got distracted. Probably we by... It. We need to do it together, maybe. The little uh, My Little Pony movie or something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah. That's, we, right. we, yeah, yeah. That's what happens when you have children. But yeah, it's it's kind of... Yeah, what does it look like to update the story? You know, when I made um, Meet the Nativity, we, we brought in a director who wasn't a Christian, but he, w- he was just... He was always trying to say, you know, I, I want you know, the Mary and Joseph figure to be in jeans, yeah, like ripped jeans. And it's got to be like, mm. um, and he was always, that was always his way of contemporizing, yeah. you know, the story. Whereas like, I kept having to point out, like, it's a time travel story. We've, we've okay. already got yeah, the yeah. 21st yeah, century. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. What they need to encounter yeah. is the chocolate box nativity, actually, because yeah. that's what's going to change them and, and bring them back. But, but, but that was the conceit by which you bring the first century and the 21st century together. Yeah. But you always have to do that somehow. Yeah. You know? But maybe maybe The Chosen does that well by just, it's good storytelling, so you just believe that you're a first century Jew. I don't know. Yeah, I, it, on the issue of, of cultural or, or non-culturally accurate depictions of Jesus, mm-hmm. it is interesting when you go to non-white cultures and they have pictures of Jesus with their mm, skin yeah. color and you know ethnic background and you think huh that's interesting yeah. that seems as though from a western point of view it is a an adopting of the gospel into the culture and people are saying look this jesus is for us too and yet weirdly it's sort of used as a stick to beat the western church to sort of say ha you painted a white jesus with blue eyes and it's like well I've, i think jesus was for white people with blue eyes as well yeah. and and yet because of the other things which are attached to the history of the west of western europe it's got much more of a sense of of oppression or of um control or belittling things mm. but i i wonder whether in in the age that we're in which is obviously so you know global um well it was till a couple of years ago and now you can't even go to rome without having <laughs> to sit in your bedroom for two days waiting for a PCR result. But um, the the challenge now, I think, is to say, okay, to have these these expressions of the gospel, to retell our story, which is the, the story of Christ, and not to fall foul of those who are have a list checking it twice to make sure that we're not, distorting the gospel do you yes. see what I mean? that's the challenge yes yes so that we can be enthusiastic about embracing art forms and and saying let's do this through film let's do this through through theater whatever it might be and yet our our struggle is going to be against obviously <laughs> not our struggle is against, is against some flesh and blood but there are some flesh and blood people who are very anxious that we would be you know going liberal if we yeah, if we were to do that, so yeah. I, that's that's the the line in a way that we have to walk if we're to be faithful and engage the arts yes. a, as Christians. I think. Yes, so th- there are always such people who will comment. For instance, on our our Christmas campaigns, there have been quite a quite a number of commenters over the years on 
<laughs> some, of, some of our videos. And we welcome them tonight. We welcome them tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You've been very well behaved in the top chat, uh, everybody. But, um, yeah, not, not everybody has always um, enjoyed our creative representations of the gospel. Um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of some, some examples. Um, there, there was the, the Meet the Nativity guy who was like, you can't. You can't just show him as a baby. He grew up. He was yeah. a carpenter. Um, <laughs> idiots who know nothing of Christ, I think, was the phrase. <laughs> That's oh. like, idiots who know nothing of Christ. Wow. He grew up to be I'm a carpenter. Was like, Which like is, of the course, idea. the most important part of the gospel story. <laughs> the idea he would have been happy if, at the end of it, he was swing, <laughs> swinging hammer. hammer. Nails. Was like, like, then they were happy. <laughs> yeah. Or... So you know, let's let's finish with this. Like, why why is it difficult to create art as Christians? Because we're we're trying to get stuff out there, um, but there are, there are fears that hold me back. I'm sure there are fears that hold you guys back in trying to be creative for Christ. Um, what are, what are the fears that hold us back? Well, I think whenever you, I mean, I'm not sure it's always limited to Christians putting stuff out there, but. You, when you, whenever you do something artistic, there is an element of your own expression coming through it, and so there is a sense in which you make yourself vulnerable mm. by putting mm. something out there. You know, it, it, for all you know, the the point is you remember that comment right. about meet the nativity, right? And there were like thousands of comments <laughs> over the weeks, but mm. the one you remember Not is one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, yeah. but you you know, it's that there is a fear of rejection. Um, mm-hmm. Or you know, whether, whether and and I think in the Christian circles, the danger of friendly fire is probably maybe feels greater than. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think. Yeah. You. How many times have we seen people pour over the words of some modern worship song, and pick it apart, right? And right. then decide that oh maybe that isn't quite theologically correct. Therefore, yeah. This person probably isn't sound. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what was that one that you didn't want heaven without you, so Jesus, you brought heaven down? Yeah, yeah. That was Which, the, I can't remember what the song is, but... but there was such a pylon over that. Mm. And yeah. it's just like... And when you look back at it, you're just like, well, it didn't say you couldn't have heaven without you. It's like you didn't want heaven without you, mm. so mm. Jesus, you brought heaven down. And yeah, and people sort of tearing apart a creative expression of the gospel. Not nice to be mm. on the on the receiving end of that mm. so that could be a fear that holds us back i de- i do think definitely the the fear of 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 the criticism which will come your way because you're not going to be able to keep all the people happy all the time and because when you're making something in one sense you're trying out something you're playing with it and you're seeing where it goes and so if if the church if the church won't allow people to try something out yeah. and to come, get the feedback and come back in, then the church will kind of stagnate. We will actually not get any new worship music. And right. the worship music that we get will be, you know, very derivative Safe. and will be very... It will, and so our creative impulse made as made in the image of God, which all people have, you know, but... Apparently, some some people call themselves creatives. Um, <laughs> I think it's is, creative. I'm a creative. creative. You're not. You are a creative person. <laughs> I'm part of a creative collective adjective. from the Pacific Northwest. Not a noun. Um, <laughs> but the um, yeah. So so the church needs to embrace that mm. that aspect of being made in the image of God. And to enjoy that, and and to enjoy it when people are, are doing things. The the challenge with a with a song, I suppose, is that it it goes onto the the list, and then it starts to form people's theology. So I think that's where a lot of the gatekeepers are nervous because they don't mm. want people to be singing things, which might lead down the line to very confused understandings. I don't want to get into that particular song. I'm not really aware of it, but the. So the, there's a fear that that you'll be kind of oh you're not allowed to do that because we need to be correct mm. and you know that's not correct yes and you think well I, I don't know that I was trying to be correct mm. for this particular point I was I was playing with an idea and was trying something out and so the the criticism and of course you know that's 
kind of life online is getting <laughs> trolled. <laughs> um, it's Spartan 300 watching thank you for joining us again we were very boring last week hope I hope this week has been what are you referring to Nathan? Nothing, nothing going on <laughs> <laughs> this is the speakeasy yeah 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 I think and one, one other thing that I think certainly in England um, it really kind of um is this this cloying desire to be effortlessly superior and and not to try, not to appear to try? Yeah, yeah. And I think I think there's there's very much a sense, especially in England, of if you put something out there, people are like, oh, who does Glenn think he is yeah. going to Rome, swanning off to Rome and yeah, saying yeah, a poem yeah. to the uh, camera? Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. I see. I see. He's uh, trying. <laughs> <laughs> Try hard. You with your words. <laughs> making trying. them rhyme. Yeah, and that was that was the, the entire point. If you see a group of lads, you know, with a, with a football group of teenage lads, the one you're they will be mocking is the one who's got the kit on ready to go enthusiastic yes the point is you're supposed to have this effortless ability to control the ball and bank into the top corner without even breaking a sweat and yeah. still wearing you know yeah, your yeah. jeans kind of thing that's cool yes it's not cool to try yes but oh obviously if we all tried we'd all do really well if i yeah yeah and that's the thing you yeah. protect yourself and so it's a defensive thing yeah. and that's why there is a fear of of i think trying things out creatively um because yeah, yeah. I think you know, yeah. I think ten years ago, I was very keen, especially on my blog, to sort of say, "Look, I just offer these things out to you. I don't, I don't claim to be any good at this. I'm just going." Mm, yeah. uh, and then I just sort of stopped because I just thought, <laughs> yeah. "Just deal with it." Yeah. If you, you know, if you think if you think I'm trying to make myself greater through it, yeah, the, there's, it, there's probably nothing I can do. To and stop the, you thinking but that. the tall poppy syndrome thing yeah. is a, yeah. is 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 significant culturally, yeah. and it it's all it, that's the same thing that makes people apologize when they put a beautiful meal in front of you. <laughs> oh, this it's awful. Oh, it's so oh goodness, I can't even bear to watch you eat it because it's so disgusting. Oh, I overcooked all of it, and you just go, why do you? Yeah. Let me eat, eat the. You. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, totally. Oh, it's fine. <laughs> but, you know, yeah, it's just that that yeah, the fear, the fear of of failure, the fear of looking like you're trying too hard, um, the tall poppy syndrome. We don't want anyone to get too big for their boots, right? You don't want to encourage someone too much. Yes. You couldn't have that. Yes. Because you know what will happen. They'll be Idolatry conceited. everywhere. <laughs> exactly. I, so. Idols. <laughs> idols everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's a challenge. Yeah. Um, but speaking of creative uh, endeavors, Paul, this Christmas. You've um, been trying. <laughs> you've been. Have you been trying? He's very. Nice talk about it. You know, just <laughs> myself. Oh, it's awful. Yeah, Paul. <laughs> yeah, it's nothing really. Nothing. Paul has been uh, going through the creative process, inspiration through to. I don't know. Where are we up to in your Christmas number one? Okay. This, Paul <laughs> Christmas number one. Soon to be released, Christmas soon. number one. Um, yeah. Like, so you've, you've done like, a, it's more than a demo track. It's going to get mixed down. It's getting mixed tomorrow, hopefully. Tomorrow. Yeah. By yeah, a guy I know called Nick Harvey, who actually works for the BBC, which is, yeah. or, you know, he, he, work, he does work for them, amongst others. He's kind of a big deal. He's kind of a big deal. He yeah. is. He is. Should we all hear the next Christmas number one? Um, <laughs> and uh, and then you can let us know where people can rush out and and buy. Um, it's called it's Christmas. It's Christmas time. It's Christmas time. It's Christmas. <laughs> it's Christmas time. It doesn't go like that. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> this is how it goes. We wish that
<laughs> it is a catchy number. Did uh, did the uh, did the lick just come fully formed? You woke up one one morning and <laughs> oh mate, I mean I just wrote it by accident when I had COVID. So you no. wrote it by accident. <laughs> I don't even know how that works. <laughs> you were walking no, I was, with no, a I tray of you. words <laughs> and you tripped. It just fell together. It wasn't really <laughs> okay. anything. But I mean, oh. speaking of art, I mean, I don't know about you, but I certainly felt myself being drawn out myself and invited into the divine as I was listening to that. So, um, <laughs> well, that, yeah, that was our... I'm sure we've all experienced that yeah, at home as well. Um, there's art and there's art, isn't there? <laughs> and that was art. <laughs> that was that art. Was, no, I, mean, I, I did. I mean, it started off just as that little guitar phrase, which I think really is based on um, Greg Lake, I believe in Father Christmas. There's, which okay. I made that comment to my mother-in-law. There's that bit in the middle of that song that goes, and it grew out of that. And she said, that's actually a piece of Russian classical music that he nicked. Oh, well. I was like, well, that's good, because I can avoid all the copyright strikes there from that go. point. So huh. that's quite good. It's and for the, for the video, are you going to get Michael Flatley? Because it's very... No, but the, the, the reason we, we, we knocked it together, um, I'd, I'd come up with this thing, and then I sent it to the guy who sings on it, Gary, who um, I've done do a bit of stuff with. Um, and we were like, oh, yeah, we'll just put it together and get it finished. And then we decided last week, we were like, well, why don't we release it? Um, and we might try and raise some money for Great Ormond Street Hospital, where Libby was uh, this year. And so um, hopefully, if we can get it mixed down tomorrow, um, it will be out some some point soon on Amazon and places you get your music. For you charity? Can, yeah, so you can spend your 99p or whatever it costs, <laughs> and then hopefully... Come on, bring down Elton John and Exactly. Ed. I mean, yeah. Elton's already had a Christmas hit. He's got Step yeah. Into Christmas. Ed Sheeran's yeah. had plenty of hits, so yeah. he doesn't need Ed it. Ed who? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Church of England, they've yeah. got one Church coming out, but it's just a cover of In the Bleak Midwinter, so it's not very original. Cliff Richard, I believe, is also... Has he? Is yeah, he? he's, oh, he's he, throwing again. his hat in the ring. So, well, so we've got big contenders there. But, Take him down. But, but I'm uh, sure what with the 20 people watching, we yeah. can come together and... <laughs> <laughs> will you will you commit <laughs> it's for charity baby it's uh it's for christmas it's for libby it's for it's for sick children everywhere and um yeah yeah but um <laughs> it's christmas and you're time on the sorry christmas time it's christmas time it's christmas. <laughs> i know what you're trying to see you're trying to see stuff for christmas it's christmas time Ooh. um <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, thank you so much for uh, joining us. Thank you very much, uh, Joy and Fraser. Um, any final words for for the people? No, 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 <laughs> no nothing. Except yeah. what they really want to say is join us in March for the yeah. next intensive. Mm. Yeah, because they're just ace, and uh, you can you can come down here to the Sunshine Coast uh, in March and in May. You can find details on uh, speaklifefoundry.com for how you can join us. And if you want to know how you can support us here at Speak Life, uh, you can go to speaklife.org.uk slash give, and uh, that will take you to different opportunities uh, that you have to give, whether it's uh, weekly or monthly, um, whether as a one-off or in an ongoing way. And if you do support us in an ongoing way, you get access to our um, Discord server where we share prayer requests and uh, we can talk about different episodes and ideas and share our work together, talk about being Christians, talk about being creatives together, mm. and uh, it's a lot of fun. Mm. So, uh, guys, thank you very much for joining us. Um, Nate Morgan Lark. Thanks, Glenn. Paul Feasy. Cheers. Cheers. See you again next week. God bless. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>